why is building a quantum computer so difficult? Okay. Well, the reason is as follows. So if I have a classical computer, right, then you can think it, it inputs bits and maybe it outputs some bits. Something like this. Okay? But with a quantum computer, okay, so the first computer is a bit. So what is a bit? A bit is just something that can be in one or two states, right? So usually the two states are called 0, 1, on, off, black, white, up, down, something like that. Right? So us human beings, we are, we are bits, right, in some sense, right, in different ways. Sometimes we're asleep, sometimes we're awake. Sometimes we're asleep, sometimes we're awake. Right? Sometimes we're happy, sometimes we're sad. Um, <clears throat> so in the 1960s and 70s, for example, you fed a computer uh, a card, and it had a bunch of holes popped out. Some, some boxes had a hole punch, some mm -hmm. boxes didn't have a hole punch. So this represents 0 or 1. Okay? Either yes, no, 0, or 1. Okay? So you, you feed the, the computer something it can recognize, something it can read as either being 0 or being 1. Okay? Now, with a quantum computer, you don't feed it bits, but you feed it something called qubits, or quantum bits. So instead of feeding it 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, you feed it a sequence of qubits. So let's say I'll say psi 1, psi 2, psi 3. And it outputs the qubit. Let's say phi 1, phi 2, and so on. And then you do some measurement process. Okay? And then you put it through some measuring device <coughs> and then the output is a classical bit. Okay? So the point with a quantum computer, and I'll, I will talk about what these qubits are, okay? but these qubits are something physical such as a proton, electron, a photon, and it's Something physical that can also have a binary property. Okay. So, for example, uh, an electron can be, s you can measure the spin of an electron with respect to a certain direction. So, you can, you can say, electron, are you s let's measure your spin in this direction. An electron will say to you, either I'm spin up or I'm spin down. Okay. So, this is an, a binary property of an electron. So, an electron can be used as a qubit. Okay? So each of these psi i's are, let's say, some sort of particle, like an electron, <coughs> which may have some binary property. We put it through a quantum computer, and it outputs some electron. Okay. But we cannot experience or perceive the general state of an electron. Okay? We cannot perceive electron, are you up or down? Okay. So what we have to do is we have to put the electrons through a measuring device, and then the electron tells us, oh, I'm up or I'm down. Okay? And the main point is, is that <coughs> before we put the electron through the measuring device, it doesn't have a well-defined notion of being up and down. So, and this is why I brought in this picture here. Okay? So an electron is something that kind of vibrates or oscillates between being up or down. Okay? It, it's not up or down, or it's not positive or negative. It's something that vibrates between the possibilities. Okay? And then when you put it through a measuring device, the measuring device collapses that vibration, and then the electron says, okay, I'm zero. Okay, you forced me. Right? A measuring device is an electron 
Electron is something that waves throughout all possibilities. We cannot experience this type of thing, right? But then we put the electron in the corners. We say, electron, what are you? You have to be something now. And then the electron says, okay, I have to be something now. I'm zero. Or the next time you do it, he says, okay, I have to be something now. I'm one. Okay? But prior to putting the electron through the measuring device, he doesn't have any well-defined notion of being zero or one. Okay? And so the reason why building a quantum computer is so hard is because anything in the environment can be considered a sort of measuring device for an electron. As soon as an electron interacts with something, right, then he's like, okay, I've interacted with you, I'm a zero or a one now. So you have to stop these qubits from interacting with their environment. They are very, 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 very sensitive. We want to keep them in their vibrating mode to do the quantum computation. We don't want to stop them from vibrating. Okay? So this is why building a quantum computer is so difficult, because we can, com we can prepare these quantum states okay, in a laboratory, but it's very hard to keep them stable. It's very hard to keep them from not interacting with their environment and then saying, okay, I'm a one now or I'm a zero now. Because all the benefits of a quantum computer come from the fact that these guys are vibrating or spinning between all different possibilities. Okay. So that's why I go back to this picture here. So we can think of this picture like uh, like three particles, three qubits, right? And they're all spinning. We put this one through a measuring device, it stops. Put this one through a measuring device, put this one through a measuring device. Now these are not qubits because there's more than one possibility. But think of instead of, you know, maybe we have four or five possibilities here, the qubit's only spinning between zero and one, or white and black, or something like that. Okay. And then, so this is a sort of three particle configuration where the measurements of the three particles are completely independent of each other. I can press the button and stop one particle, press the button again and stop the next particle, and press the button again and stop the next particle. Right? But not all particles have this kind of behavior. There's something called entanglement where some particles are spinning together. Okay? So when you stop one, to measure it, you automatically stop the other one at the same time, even though you didn't try to measure the other one. Okay? And the crazy thing about this is even though these particles are spinning together, you know, I can take this particle, put them in my pocket, and I can give the other particle to you, and you put them in your pocket, and now we go in spaceships to two opposite sides of the universe, and the particles are still spinning together. And when I measure one, when I stop the spinning, the other one automatically stops spinning as well at the same time. No matter how far apart they are. And Einstein didn't like this at all. Because Einstein says, well, you know, according to my theory, you know, information cannot travel faster than the speed of light. So how does your particle who's spinning over here, my particle who's spinning over here, when I stop this particle from spinning and measure it, how does the other particle know that I stopped it from spinning so that it stops at the same time? How does the other particle know? Well, nobody really knows. This is just how entangled particles behave. And this is something that's actually been tested in the laboratory. And it's a, and it's a feature, it's actually not a bad thing, it's a feature that a quantum computer takes advantage of. is the fact that we can have these particles spinning together, or entangled particles. <coughs> so now, instead of just talking about them, I want to show you, <coughs> so if you read a, a book about quantum computing, right, so quantum computing is based from quantum physics. So a lot of the notations and everything come from the physicist notation. Okay? And for me, the physicist notation is very cumbersome and bulky. And, and so... And they also have these different conventions coming from quantum physics, but in quantum computing, we don't need a lot of the complications that come from quantum physics. We can simplify things and make the mathematics much more simple. Okay? So, for example, <coughs> a 
right? All the mathematics that we need for quantum computing is just like uh, manipulating polynomial and two variables, except that the two variables in the polynomial, they don't commute. So x, y is not equal to y, x, okay? <clears throat> so now when I'm writing x, y, I'm thinking of this binary property that the particle may have, okay? Zero or one. But it would look kind of weird when I, I want to think in terms of polynomials. So it's essentially saying that zero, one is not equal to one, zero. If you think in terms of bits, right, this is obvious. This bit string is not equal to this bit string. Okay? So, let's say I have a degree one polynomial in x and y. Okay? But now when I say degree one, I mean that it only has terms of degree one, meaning it doesn't have a term of degree zero. I don't mean the highest term is degree one, I mean every term is degree one. So a general degree one polynomial, we call this homogeneous, meaning that every monomial in the polynomial has the same degree. Okay? So a general polynomial in degree one is of the form a times x plus b times y. Okay? And physicists, they like to take a and b to be complex numbers. But for us, for quantum computing, I say we don't need complex numbers. We don't even need complex numbers. All we need are integers. Okay. So I'm just going to take a and b to b and z. Okay. So this is what's called a one particle state. of a single particle, okay? So for a bit, the only states for a bit are zero and one, okay? But a particle, such as an electron or a proton, can be in a state which is a combination of, so I'm thinking of x as zero and y as one, okay? But a, a one particle state, a quantum state, or a, a particle such as an electron and a proton has a state which is a combination of both zero and one, okay? And so physicists like to say that it's both zero and one at the same time, which is one way you can think of it, okay? So it's kind of like, um, I don't have a coin, but you know, people like to flip a coin, right? And say, oh, it lands heads or tails, right? But when the coin is in your pocket, is it heads or tails? No, it has both properties at once, right? When you flip a coin and it lands on the table, you're putting the coin in a situation where the coin has to give you an answer and say, okay, I'm heads or okay, I'm tails, all right? And it's similar with a quantum state. It's partly in zero and it's partly in one. And when you measure it or you look at it, you're putting it in a situation where it has to give you an answer. I'm either, I'm either um, in state one or state zero, okay? So this is how we represent a one particle state in quantum mechanics or quantum computing, okay? It's just ax plus by. Now what do these coefficients mean, the a and the b? What do they mean? So let's call this state psi. So what do the coefficients a and b mean? It means if I go and look at psi, okay, then the probability I see psi in state x is equal to a squared over a squared plus b squared. Okay. So this is a probability. 
right? And the probability <coughs> I see psi and state y is equal to b squared over a squared plus b squared. Okay? So it's important that I square things here because my coefficients a and b, they, they can be negative. Right? These are integers. All right? So here's this quantum <coughs> state, psi, representing some particle. Right? And so it's oscillating between x and y. And then now I go and look at it. When I look at it, it stops the vibrating of the particle. And when I look at it, the probability that I see psi and state x is a squared over a squared plus b squared. And the probability that I observe psi and state y is b squared over a squared plus b squared. So quantum mechanics doesn't say anything about what psi will be or why it ends up in state x or state y. It only tells us probabilities. Okay? <coughs> so quantum mechanics essentially is a theory which allows you to calculate probabilities of measurements or observations. Okay? Now, from here on, Instead of writing my states as a, as x and y, I'm going to write uh, states like this, like white plus black. Well, it looks like black plus white. Okay. So I'll write my, my state like this, or let's say white minus black. Okay. And so this is like my x now, and this is like my, my y now. Okay. So what about uh, two particle states? So you can think of one particle states, two particle states, three particle states, and, and so on. You can think of these as like vector spaces. Okay? Um, but instead of using real numbers or a field for my coefficients, I'm just going to use integers instead. Okay, so two particle states you can think of as like a vector space, and the basis <coughs> is the following. So we have white, 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 black, <coughs> black, white, and black. So this is a basis, a basis for the two particle states. Okay. Now elements of this basis are the things we can observe in the laboratory. So for example, when we observe two qubits, two particles, we're always going to see either white, 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 black, black, white, or black, black. Right? Where this, when I point to the first one, this is always the first particle, and this is always the second particle, okay? But a general state is not one of these observable states. A general state is something like A1 plus A2 plus A3 plus A4. So a general state looks something like this. Okay, but when we go to observe it in the laboratory, okay, we see white, white with probability A1 squared over A1 squared plus, plus A4 squared. Okay. So this is the probability of observing white, white in the laboratory. Okay? And similarly, the, the probability of, of observing black, white Okay, is a3 squared over this sum. Okay? So the mathematics underlying these quantum states are, are very simple. Right? It's just like a, um, a polynomial algebra, except our variables don't commute. Right? White black is not equal to black white. Okay? Okay, so now that I've said enough about uh, how quantum states are represented. Mathematically, let me go to my slides.
Okay, so, so now this is a very important notion uh, for quantum physics and quantum computing in general is that of entangled and separable states. Okay. So I say an element psi is entangled, right? I say an irreducible element. Irreducible just means I cannot factor it, right? So for example, this state, let's say I say white plus black times white minus black. So what state is this? This is white, white uh, minus white, black. And then plus black, white. And then minus black, black. Right? This state here is not irreducible. What that means is that I can factor it or reduce it. Okay? So this state here is, is not what's called an entangled state. This is called a separable state. So it means that the first particle, the measurement of the first particle and the second particle, they're spinning at, at rates which don't have anything to do with each other. Okay? So if I can factor a state into degree one factors, okay? so this is a degree two state. If I can factor it into two degree one states, it's called separable. Okay? If I can't factor it at all, then it's called entangled. Right, so here's yeah, I gave I did the same example, same example here. Okay, so with this state here, right, each of these white white, white black, black white, and black black, each have a probability of one fourth of being seen in the laboratory. Okay, so you might say, well, what's the difference if we're just squaring things here? If I just replace these minuses by a plus. Right, wouldn't I get the same thing? Well, you get the same probabilities, but you wouldn't get this factorization here. And the fact that this state factors makes a huge difference. Okay? <clears throat> okay. And so, yeah, so the picture I showed before of these three things spinning together, and I can stop this one, and then later stop this one, and later stop this one, this would be a three particle state that's separable. Okay? So I can, I can each, the measurement of each particle doesn't affect the measurement of the other ones. Okay. okay, now these are examples of entangled states. These are very special entangled states which are at the heart of uh, what makes a quantum computer so interesting. Okay. So for example, the states white, white, plus or minus black, black. Okay or white, black, plus or minus black, white. These cannot be factored. Okay, so you can just check yourself. I cannot factor this as a, as a one particle state times another one particle state. So these are what's called entangled states, or, um, uh, and they have special names called Bell states or EPR pairs. Okay? So for example, if we consider the state psi white, white, black, black, okay, then the probability of seeing white, white is equal to the probability of seeing black, black is equal to one half. But what this means is very special. So it means that these two particles will always be observed to be the same color. Okay? So this may not seem like a big deal. I'm just writing white, white, and black, black. But the point is that these two particles can be separated on opposite ends of the universe. And no matter what I observe the first particle to be, if I observe this particle to be black, then the second particle on the other side of the universe is also going to be observed to be black. Or, if I observe the first particle to be white, then the second particle on way on the other side of the universe is also going to be observed to be white. They're always going to be observed to be the same thing. So you can think of this as like my spinning example here. Okay, ignore this one here. So an entangled state, the, the two particles are spinning together. And when you press the button to stop it, they both stop at the same time. Okay? So this is very, very strange. And this is something that Einstein didn't like about quantum mechanics <coughs> at all. 
Okay, and they will play a, um, a role coming up in the examples we consider. Are there any questions? Hmm? Why is a square over a square plus b square not a over b a plus b? Because the coefficients can be negative. And you want it to be a probability. Probabilities are never negative. Right? So if I had the, the state, um, let's say white minus black, then I would have 1 over 1 plus 1 uh, being observed in white. And then I'd have minus 1 over 1 plus 1 uh, being observed black. <coughs> but this is not a probability. <coughs> right? Because this is minus 1 half. So to turn it into a probability, we square everything. Then it becomes a probability. How about the absolute value? Um, yeah, I think that's, if you want, you mean just to take absolute value of A, value of B. Does, does that work? I think so. I think that works. That may work as well. I don't have a I don't have a great answer right now for why we use the squares instead of absolute values. Um, yeah, maybe uh, we can think about that later, but this is how the probabilities are computed. Or maybe, maybe this definition of probability is not what you observe in the laboratory. So maybe this notion to get probabilities is what we actually observe in the laboratory. Okay. So the theory is formulated to, to match experiment about what we see in the laboratory in nature. And it's this notion of probability, this is the one that, that works. I don't have a mathematical explanation, but this is based off of empirical measurements that we make in the real world. Okay? No, I haven't gotten into quantum computing yet. Okay. <clears throat> so, okay, so here's an example of a three particle state uh, white, 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 black, 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 white. And black, black, black. In this state, factors has this factorization. Okay, so it's not a separable state because to be a separable state, it would need to split into three factors. But this splits into one degree two factor and one degree one factor. So this means that the the first two particles are entangled; they're spinning together. Okay, and the third particle is independent of the other two. So the other third particle is also spinning, but it's not spinning together with the other two. So I can measure them independently of each other. Okay. So the way to think of this state is like this. So two particles are spinning together. right? So when I measure one particle, when I press the button, they both stop together. But then I can press the button on this third particle independently of the second two. Okay. <clears throat> So the thing I showed you at the beginning with the three things spinning, right? we can think of this as a three-particle state in quantum mechanics. Okay? So nobody knows actually what's going on in the quantum realm. right? So different people have their, their, their different explanations or their favorite interpretation, but nobody knows. The fact of the matter is that nobody knows what is going on with the quantum state when we don't look at it or we don't measure it. Okay? But this is... This mathematical model that we have for quantum states is what fits with what we observe in the laboratory. It's the best theory that anybody has so far to model um, fundamental particles. OK, so now we're going to start getting towards quantum computing. Okay, So there's something called a Pete box okay? um, <clears throat> built by some guy named Pete. Okay? And 
So let's say you put white balls through a peat box. So a white ball you can think of as like a particle, but we've observed it. Okay, so the particle says, okay, I'm zero. Okay. And when you put white balls through a peat box, they, they come out either black or white with 50% odds. Right? Half the time when you put in a white ball, they come out white. Half of the time they come out black. And same thing for a black ball. When I put black balls through a peat box, okay, half the time they come out white, and half the time they come out black. Okay? And this is this is I know this is a drawing, but this is something that that actually happens that you can build in a laboratory. Okay? So you can prepare an, a particle in either of these observable states, this black or white state. You put it through a peat box, and then the particle comes out white half the time and black half the time. Okay? So you say, okay, maybe you know there's a little guy inside the peat box, and he flips a coin, and if it's heads, he changes the color, and if it's tails, he leaves the color alone. Maybe it's something like that. Okay. But when you put a white particle through two peat boxes, two successive peat boxes, it always comes out white. And when you put a black particle through two successive peat boxes, it always comes out black. And this is something that you can actually observe in the laboratory. It's not just a game I'm making up. This is an actual a property of these particles. So if there is a little coin flipper inside the peat box saying, if I see heads, I switch the particle, and if I see tails, I leave it alone, then Flipping a coin twice, with the output would still be random, right? But for some reason, when we put a white ball through two peat boxes, it comes out always comes out white. And we put a black ball through two peat boxes, it always comes out black. So what is going on? So can you come up with a rule for the peat box such that when you do it twice, it always comes out the same. Okay. So I'll give you a hint. What the peat box does is it takes this input state, like 0, 1. And when it enters the peat box, right, <coughs> the peat box transforms it into a more general state. So instead of being just white or black, the peat box puts it into something like white minus black or something like that. Okay. So this is what's called a quantum gate. So in computers, we feed a computer bits. A computer's made of some circuit that has some gates, right? And it has some rules for how it manipulates the bits. Okay? So this is something called a quantum gate. All right? And it's basically the only quantum gate that we'll need for the examples that I'll explain um, after the break. Okay? So after the break, I will show you what these peat boxes are doing to the balls okay? and why when you run it through a peat box one time, you see white half the time and black half the time. But when you run it through twice, you always see the same color. Okay. So I'll let you maybe think about how the peat box does that. Right? Or what kind of rule the peat box is doing. How the peat box is manipulating these, these states. Okay, so let's see what these peat boxes are actually doing. So these peat boxes are what are called in quantum computing Hadamard gates. Okay? So what is a Hadamard gate? So this is what I call the space, the vector space of uh, one particle states, Q1. Okay? So it's just a two-dimensional vector space. So a Hadamard gate is just a linear map. So we know about linear maps from linear algebra, right? It's just a linear map from Q1 to Q1, from one particle states to one particle states. And to specify a linear map, it's enough to say what it does on the basis. If you know what a linear map does on the basis, then you know what it does on everything, by linearity, right? OK, so the Hadamard gate, or the peat box, takes the one particle state white to white plus black, all right? And here, I meant to write black here. And it takes black so white minus black. Okay? And then I define find the nth Hadamard gate. So if you have an n particle state, right, the nth Hadamard gate just applies the Hadamard gate to each particle individually and multiplies the result. 
Okay. Okay. So let's look at what happens when we apply the Hadamard gate twice. Right? If we apply the Hadamard gate twice to the white ball, okay, so H of H of white, then we're doing H of white plus black, right? Then this is H of white, because H of white is white plus black, right? And then so we're doing H of that, so we get H of white plus H of black, which is white plus black, plus white minus black, and we get two times white. Right? So two times white, from our perspective, is the same thing as white. Because what's the probability of observing white? Well, two squared over two squared, one. Right? So when we input a white ball into the Hadamard gate, we will always see it coming out as a white ball. Right? And if I apply a Hadamard gate twice to a black ball, right? then here I get H of H of black, which is H of white minus black. So then it's h of white minus h of black, because h is linear. So I get white plus black minus white minus black, which is equal to 2 times black. So we always see it coming out as black. Okay? So it's very simple. I don't think this is difficult to understand. And this is another reason why I like telling people about this, because a lot of people, there's kind of this um, perception that quantum computing or quantum mechanics is difficult to understand. I don't think it's difficult to understand. It's difficult to be comfortable with, to think, oh, how can a particle on this side of the universe and a particle on the other side of the universe be spinning together such that when I stop the spinning over here, it stops the spinning of the one over here. But I think um, the mathematics can be done very simply. So this is not how you're going to see it presented in a quantum computing book. So, um, but essentially, this, this is an equivalent formulation. Okay? And I think this could be taught to high school students. So in the next example, we're going to cover what's called a non-local game played by two contestants, which we'll call Alice and Bob. Now in the non-local game, Alice and Bob are not playing against each other, they're part of a team. And in this game, Alice and Bob can gain a quantum leverage in the game by sharing an entangled state. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about how two players... Um, play what's called a non-local game, and there is no classical strategy they can employ to win the game, but using a simple quantum computer, namely if they just have a Hadamard gate with them, and they prepare some two-particle states, then they can win a game that they would never be able to win classically. I mean, they would, they would have no winning strategy, but now they can win this game 100%. Okay? So this is the game. So we have two players, Alice and Bob. You can think of this game as in a casino or something like that. They both go into their own rooms. Alice goes into one room, and then Bob goes into another room. Okay? And Alice and Bob, they cannot communicate with each other. So this is Alice's room. Let's say and this is Bob's room. Okay? So in Alice's room, she sees some sort of screen. Maybe it's not so fancy like this. But she stands in front of this screen, and instead of being so fancy like a Pac-Man game, the screen is just going to show H or T randomly, like heads or tails at fixed time intervals. So let's say <coughs> every 10 seconds, it's going to show either heads or tails, show an H or a T. Okay? And then Alice, she's got, let's say, two buttons to press. Every time she sees H or T, she has to press white or black. Okay? And similarly for Bob. Bob's in his room. He also sees a screen that every 10 seconds it's going to show either heads or tails randomly. And every time Bob sees heads or tails, right, they have to press white. He has to press white or black. Okay? But what's the game? How do you win the game? Okay? They win the game if whenever both their screens show tails, they both press black. Okay? So they win the game if Alice's screen shows tails, meaning T, and Bob's screen also shows tails, and they both press black, then they win the game. Okay? So then you might say, well, this is easy. Alice and Bob know this. They know how to win the game. They know that if they're both their uh, screens show tails, right, and they both press black, they win the game. 
But there are also losing combinations. Otherwise, they would just tell each other, okay, we'll go in the room and we'll just press black. We'll just keep pressing black, and then eventually tails, tails will come, and then we win the game. Okay? But no, there are three losing combinations. Okay? <clears throat> there are three losing combinations. So, HB, HB. So this means um, Alice's screen shows heads, Bob's screen sh shows heads, and they both press black. Okay? If that happens, then they lose the game. Okay? Meaning if both their screens show heads and they both press black, they lose the game. Okay? If Alice's screen shows tails and she presses black, and Bob's screen shows heads and he presses white, then they also lose. Okay? Now, if Alice's screen shows heads and Bob's screen shows tails, and Alice presses white and Bob presses black, then they also lose. Lose. Okay? So there's four possibilities for their screen. H H, the first one I'm saying is Alice's, second is Bob's. H H, H T, T H, or T T. When their screen shows T T, there's one winning combination and no losing combinations. But for each of the combinations H H, H T, and T H, there's a losing combination. Okay? So they're much more likely to lose the game than win the game. So if they if any of these outcomes happen before they press black black on tails tails, then they lose the game. Okay? And the way that these losing combinations are chosen are in such a way that there's no winning strategy that they can agree upon. So for example, um, I represent a strategy like this. So let me write it on the board. So let's say a strategy they agree upon is something like this. Um, so what does this mean? So this is um, Alice's choices, this is Bob's choices, and this is if she see, they see heads or tails. So this is a strategy where if Alice sees heads, she's going to press white, and if she sees tails, she's going to press black. Okay? And Bob's just always going to press black. Okay? But you can see, no matter how they form a matrix like this, it's always going to contain one of the losing outcomes. So, for example, this matrix here contains the outcome um, heads white and then tails black, right? Which is one of the losing outcomes. Heads white and tails black. Is that clear? Because this is very important that you understand the rules of the game. Right? So this is a strategy that Alice and Bob can come up with beforehand. But no matter how they come up with a strategy like this, it will always contain one of these losing outcomes. Right? Otherwise, it wouldn't be a good game for the casino to have. Right? If there could be a winning strategy. Right? No matter what strategy they agree on before the game, it will always include one of these losing outcomes. Either heads black, heads black, tails black, heads white, heads white, tails black. Okay. So we understand what these, these tuples mean, right? The first tuple is what, what Alice does. Namely, she sees heads and presses black. The second um, entry is what Bob does. He sees heads and he presses black. Okay. So no matter what kind of strategy they agree on before the game, it will always contain one of these losing outcomes. So for example, this strategy here contains the losing outcome, namely uh, heads white and tails black. Right, this is a losing, losing outcome. So now, what I claim is, is that <clears throat> using a simple quantum computer consisting only of a single Hadamard gate, Alice and Bob can always win this game. Meaning they'll never produce one of the losing outcomes. Okay? And this is how they do it. Okay. 
So Alice and Bob's quantum strategy is this. So what they do is they pair, prepare a large number of these states. This is a two-particle state, right? White, white, plus white, black, plus black, white. Okay? This is a two-particle state. And now they prepare a large number of copies of these states. All right? So, <clears throat> and then Alice takes all of his balls into the room with him, and Alice takes all of her balls into the room with her. Okay? So even though they have the balls you know, by themselves, the balls are still together in a two-particle state. Okay? So this is not a state that you can factor. This is an entangled state. Okay? And then they come up with this agreement. They say, okay, Alice says, Bob, whenever we see heads on our screen, we're not going to do anything to our particle. We're just going to look at it and observe it. And if, if you see your particle is white, you press white. If you observe the particle is black, you press black. And I'm going to do the same thing. Okay? But if we see tails, then what we're going to do is we're going to put our particle through a Hadamard gate or a peat box. All right? And then we're going to look at the particle. And then if we see white, we press white. And if we see black, we press black. Okay? So this leads to two different op four different operations on the quantum state as a whole. So FHH, FHT, FTH, and FTT. So this is an operation on the quantum state when they both see heads. This is an operation on the quantum state when Alice sees heads and Bob sees tails. This is an operation on the quantum state when Alice sees tails and Bob sees heads. And this is an operation on the quantum state when they both see tails. So for example, in this operation, Alice is not going to do anything to her particle because she sees heads. But Bob, since he sees tails, he's going to put his particle through a peat box or a hater mark game. Okay? And now we, just, we can compute the result of doing these four operations on this state. Okay? So here's what you can kind of think of as going on. Okay, so when Alice's screen shows tails, she's got her particle in a storage box. Why does she have it in a storage box? Because you need to isolate your quantum particles. You need to keep them isolated from their environment so they stay in their quantum state. Okay? And so she has her particle in a storage box, and she puts it through a peat box. She sees it come out black, so she says black, and she presses black on her screen. Okay? <clears throat> Okay, so let's look at these four operations on the quantum state uh, psi, which is white, white, plus white, black, plus black, white. Okay? So when they both see heads, they both do nothing to their particle. Okay? So that means it just remains in this state. So that means either they're both going to see white, or Alice is going to see white and Bob is going to see black, or Alice is going to see black and Bob is going to see white. Okay? Now notice that the losing outcome for heads heads never <coughs> happens. What's the losing outcome for heads heads? The losing outcome for heads heads is them both pressing black. All right? So that's part of the reason why they chose this quantum state to prepare. Okay? Because they know that when they see heads heads, they're never both going to see black. Right? They may both see white, or one sees white and the other sees black, but they're never both going to see black. Okay? Now let's look at the second case, namely when Alice's screen shows heads and Bob's screen shows tails. Okay? If Alice sees her screen as heads, she's not going to do anything to her particle. So Alice doesn't do anything to her particle. But Bob is going to put his particle through a hay to mark gate, or a peat box. Okay? So we just apply H to the second particle in the state, okay? And so we get H of white is white plus black, H of black is white minus black, H of white is white plus black, okay? And now we just do simple algebra. We multiply out the states, and we get 2 times white white plus black white plus black black, okay? And you'll see that we never get the losing state or the losing outcome. The losing outcome for heads tails. So the losing outcome for heads tails is white black. Okay? And I think here we never get white black. Yeah. 
We never get white black here. Okay? So that means when Alice's screen shows tails and Bob's screen shows black, they're never going to hit the losing outcome of white black. Okay? And similarly for tails heads. For tails heads, Alice's screen shows tails, Bob's screen shows heads. So Alice is going to put her particle through a peat box, and Bob is going to do nothing to his, his particle. Okay? And so here we get white plus black, white plus black, white minus black, and we just multiply it out. Okay? And then we get white white plus white black plus black black. So we don't see black white, which is the losing outcome for tails heads. See, for tails heads, the losing outcome is black white, which doesn't appear here. So now you notice why the minus signs are so important. Because the minus signs, what they do is they make certain things interfere with each other, or namely cancel out. Okay? So here, we had a black white state here, right? But then it cancels out with this black white state over here. Right, so this minus signs, these minus signs are an essential feature of quantum mechanics and what makes quantum mechanics so special. Because it means different outcomes can cancel each other out. Okay? So what quantum computing basically is, is to kind of choreograph these cancellations in such a way that you, you get outcomes that a classical computer can never achieve. Okay? And similarly for tails tails. Right, for tails tails, it doesn't really matter because we don't have any losing outcomes on tails tails. Right? There's no way we can lose the game on tails tails, but we can win the game when we press black black. Okay? So when their screen shows tails tails, they're going to press black black one twelfth of the time. Because what's the probability of them both seeing black? Well, it's negative one squared over three squared plus one squared plus one squared plus minus one squared which is 1 over 12, okay? <clears throat> so they can keep going, keep playing this game, and they'll never lose. They'll never hit a winning combination. But when their screens show tails, tails, they'll hit the winning combination 1 out of 12 times, okay? So this is an instance where they have a quantum strategy where they'll always win the game. So maybe the guy who owns the casino, you know, he knows, oh, there's no way anybody can have a strategy to win this game, right? But Alice and Bob, they've broken the casino, right? They go inside. This guy says, what is going on? These two people, they always go in there. Sometimes they play for a real long time, but they always end up winning. They never lose. What's going on? He cannot figure it out because he doesn't know that Alice and Bob are cheating. They have a quantum computer, okay? And you can really do this. The thing is you can really do this in the real life is that in nature there really exist states like this state psi here. You have two balls and they're a combination of being white, 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 black, and black, white. There really exist states of nature like that. I mean that's the amazing thing about the quantum computing is that nature really behaves this way. The fundamental particles that make up anything we can touch, see, feel, hear, or taste are made up of things that behave this way, that behave so differently than our intuition could ever imagine. Okay? So I have two more examples of what you can do with a quantum computer that you can't do with a classical computer. I don't know if I'll have time for both, but hopefully I have time for both. Okay? Now the next one is called quantum teleportation. So I don't know if you, if you know about teleportation, but when I was a kid there was a show called Star Trek. So it takes place with some people, you know, science fiction, some good people on a spaceship going to different galaxies. And one thing they could do is they could teleport themselves. So, so Captain Kirk, he could go in part of the spaceship, and he'd go in this uh, little room, and he'd say, beam me up, Scotty. And then they would, some lasers would come down on him, and then his body would teleport to another part of the universe. All right? So they call this teleportation. So now with... Um, quantum computers, right, we can not teleport people yet, but we can teleport a quantum state, okay, using only classical information. So the reason why I included this quote 
is from Wikipedia. It says, understanding quantum teleportation requires a good grounding in finite dimensional algebra, Hilbert spaces, and projection matrices. I disagree with this fact. I think you can explain quantum teleportation to basically anybody. Okay? And that's what I'm going to do now. Okay? But for quantum teleportation, we need one more type of gate. And it's not a quantum gate. Okay? This is a gate that a classical computer um, can manipulate. It's called the C0 gate. So the C0 gate takes a two-particle state to a two-particle state. And what it does is if the first particle is white, it does nothing to the second particle. But if the first particle is black, it flips the second particle. Okay? So it's called the controlled not gate. That's why it's called C0 gate. So all we need for quantum teleportation is a Hadamard gate, or a peat box, and a C0 gate. Okay? So now, suppose Alice and Bob are in other ends of the universe, okay? But before they were separated, they prepared um, uh, this quantum state, right? We call this an EPR pair, white, white, plus black, black. Bob still has his particle. He's isolated from the environment. And Alice still has her particle, and she's isolated from the environment. And now Alice and Bob are in other ends of the universe, but they can communicate with each other through a classical channel. So basically, uh, Alice can say, yeah, I've measured my, par my particle, and I see white, or I measure my particle, and I see black. So they can communicate, but they're separated, in, let's say, in distant galaxies or something like that. And <clears throat> Alice wants to send Bob a cubic psi. So an arbit arbitrary qubit psi, let's say alpha white plus beta black, some arbitrary quantum state. Alice doesn't know what the quantum state is, but she has to send it to Bob. Okay? So this is what Alice is going to do. So Alice needs to send this state psi to Bob, but she only can send Bob classical information. And, and you'll see what I mean. Okay? So here's a protocol for how Alice can send or teleport the state psi to Bob. Okay, so the, the main, why this is called teleportation is that this quantum state psi is not going to be sent physically through a channel. Okay, Alice is still going to have the state in her possession the whole time. But she's going to be able to communicate, transfer that state to Bob. Okay, she's going to be able to send Bob a signal such that when Bob receives the signal, he'll be able to put his state, his particle, through a Hadamard gate or something like that, and then he'll know, he'll know how to reconstruct the state psi. Okay? So this is what the, um, Alice does. The first step is she combines the state psi with the EPR pair to get the state psi zero. So all she does is she combines psi uh, with, the, with the state, okay? meaning just you consider all the particles together. Okay, so now Alice has two particles. She has the first particle in this state and the state psi. So Alice has two particles. Bob only has one particle. Okay, so she combines them together to get the state psi zero. All right. Now Alice then inputs her two qubits. She's got two particles. Okay, she inputs her two qubits into a C not gate. Okay. So Alice has a two-particle state. Now again, I'm just saying how C0 acts on a basis. If you have a general linear combination of a basis, you just extend the C0 gate linearly. Right? So it's a linear map on the whole space. Is that clear? OK, so Alice has a two-particle state. She sends it through a C0 gate. Okay. This yields a state psi 1. Okay. Now after she gets the output from sending her two particles into a C0 gate. She inputs the first qubit, psi1, she inputs the first particle into a Hadamard gate. Okay? Then she observes the output of her two particles, and then she reports what she sees to Bob. Okay? So let's see what this means mathematically. So it means first Alice just combines her state, um, the state psi, which she hasn't looked at, Okay, so this is the state psi zero. It's just psi times the shared state between Alice and Bob. Okay, then Alice she puts her two particles into a C not gate. Okay, so this is the the first state alpha white 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 plus alpha white black black plus beta black white white plus beta black black black. Okay, 
Then Alice puts her two particles into a C not gate. So that means she puts these two. So this is a linear operation, right? So the, these these two particles go through a C not gate. These two states go through a C not gate, and so on. Okay. The third particle represents Bob's particle. He's not doing anything to his particle. Okay. So after we do this, so for example, white white just stays as white white. White black stays as white black, but black white switches to black black, and black black switches to black white here, because that's what the C not gate does. Okay, so we combine those terms together, all right, and we get something which I can factor like this: alpha times white times white white plus black black plus beta times black uh, times black white plus white black. Okay. Now Alice puts her first particle through a Hadamard gate. Okay. So that's just applying H to this and then H to this particle here. Okay. okay, once she does that, white gets sent to white plus black. Black gets sent to white minus black. Right. And then we rewrite the state as follows. As white, white. So you just do some algebra. And you can write this as white white plus alpha white plus beta black plus white black times alpha black plus beta white plus black white times alpha white minus beta black plus black black. Okay? So that means when, Al when Alice looks at her two particles, she's either going to see white white, white black, black white, or black black. Okay? Now, she gets on her phone and she sends Bob a text. She says, Bob, I observe white, white. And then Bob knows, ah, that means my particle is in state side. Right? And then if Alice texts Bob and says, oh, I see white, black, right? Then Bob knows, oh, this is the state my particle is in. So all I have to do is send this particle through what's called a swap gate, meaning where it just switches the coefficients, and then I've recovered the state side. So the point is, is that no matter what Alice texts Bob, Bob knows the state of his particle. So Bob's been sitting there doing nothing to his particle. But the fact that Alice has been doing things to her two particles has altered the state of Bob's particles, even though they're on separate sides of the universe. Okay? So this is the point, is that no matter what Alice reports to Bob, Bob knows exactly what he can do to his state to switch it into psi. So for example, if Alice reports black-white to Bob, okay, then Bob knows his state is in this state, so he knows he just has to put it through what's called a Z gate or something. A Z gate takes um, just basically switches the sign of the of the two particles. Okay? So Bob he knows exactly what to do to his state to recover the state sign. Okay? Only receiving a text from Alice. Okay. So so we can think of the state side as being transported to Bob. Okay? With no error, with zero error whatsoever. Okay, <clears throat> for my last example, okay. now suppose there is a, a bank with many vaults, okay, and in each vault in the bank there's eight gold bars, okay. Now for added security, right, because people could break break into the banks, right. So for added security, let's say some of the vaults contain all fakes, all fake gold bars. <clears throat> And some of the vaults contain four real gold bars and four fakes. Okay? Now, when an employee of the bank goes into a vault, if a customer asks you know, for his gold bar, she has to be able to tell which one is real and which one is fake. Right? So in each vault, there's a computer. Right? In this example, the author calls it Archimedes, or Achimida. 
right? So there's a computer, Archimedes, and how does the employee tell whether the gold bar is real or fake? Well, each gold bar is labeled by a three-particle state, classical state, okay? These are just classical bits, all right? And so, for example, if you, we want to tell if this gold bar is real or not, we just input the state labeled by this gold bar. We put a black ball here, a white ball here, and a black ball here, okay? Then we run it through the computer Archimedes, all right? And then if this black ball, we always put in a black ball here. If this black ball changes to white, then that means it's a real gold bar. Okay. But if the black ball stays being a black ball, then that means it's a fake gold bar. Okay? Okay, so now a robber has broken into the bank, let's say, and he has some inside information. The robber knows exactly how the Archimedes computer works, okay? But now he's in a he's in a vault, right? And he doesn't know if he's in a vault with all reals or half fakes. I mean, with all fakes or half reals, right? And a robber doesn't have a lot of time, right? So he doesn't have time to check each single gold bar. He's got to be in the bank and out of the bank quickly, okay? So. <clears throat> And he cannot just go into every vault and just take all the gold bars, because he, he can only carry so much with him. So if he's in a vault with all fakes, he wants to know immediately so he can get to the vault that has half reels. Okay? And so he knows how the Archimedes gate works, all right? But he's brought with him some Hadamard gates. Okay? The robber, the robber has access to some Hadamard gates. Okay? And what he's going to do is, when he's... He's going to form his own computer, all right? And he's going to form his own computer on a four-particle state. And what he's going to do is he's going to first, you know, so in the computer Archimedes, you put four, four balls into it, okay? What he's going to do is he's going to put a peat box above each entry here, okay? Before going through the Archimedes gate. And then he's going to put a peat box on these three outputs. Okay? So he's amending this computer and making it into a quantum computer. Okay? So the robber's computer R, all right, means he first puts the four balls through a Hadamard gate. This is H4. That just means you put each ball through a Hadamard gate. Then he's going to run the four balls through the Archimedes computer, all right? And then he's going to run the first three balls. So this is what a gate, which I call, where you run the first three balls through a Hadamard gate and you do nothing to the fourth ball. Okay? So he's going to make his own quantum computer using the computer Archimedes. Okay? And now there could be two separate cases. Let's consider the first case where the robber is in a vault with all fakes. Okay? Now, if the robber is in a vault with all fakes, then that means Archimedes does nothing, right? It means whatever you put into Archimedes, right, we're always going to put a black ball here, right, it's never going to change the black ball. So the Archimedes is what's like what we call the identity function. It's just whatever you input it, it's going to output the same thing, okay? <clears throat> so in this case, the computer that the robber has constructed, right, in the middle we had the Archimedes computer, but that's just identity, so we can ignore it. So it's just, we put the first four inputs each through Hadamard gates, and then we put the first three outputs into a Hadamard gate, okay? So we're going to input this state into our computer, so it means we put the f first four inputs into a Hadamard gate, okay? And then Whatever comes out, the remaining output, I didn't have space in the slides to write out. It's, it's a little bit long, the computation. Okay? And then we take the first three inputs and then put them through a Hadamard gate and do nothing to the last input. Okay? And when you do all the algebra and you, work, and you work out what happens, we get something like this, meaning that you're always going to observe the first three balls to be white. Okay? So, so the, the robber, he doesn't even look at the output of the fourth state. All he cares about is the first three balls. He knows that if the first three balls come out white, then he's necessarily 
in a, a, a vault with all fakes. Okay? Well, you could say maybe this happens in also in the case when he's in the vault with all reals, but then it wouldn't be an interesting example. Okay? So he knows that if he's in a ball with all fakes, then he's going to see the output of his state, of his computer. The first three balls are always going to be white. Okay? Now the second case is in the robber is in a vault with four real gold bars and four fakes. Okay? <clears throat> so in this time, Archimedes, what does it do? Well, on half of the, the states you put into Archimedes, namely the ones with fake gold bars, it does nothing. Right? So half the time, Archimedes is going to do nothing. And half the time, maybe the other four times, when you input a real gold bar, Archimedes is going to change the, the fourth input. Okay? So let's suppose that the locations of the real gold bars are white, white, black, white, black, white, black, white, black, and black, black, black. Because remember, the locations of the bars are labeled by these states. Okay? Are labeled by these three bit states. Okay. Okay, so Archimedes X does nothing to these eight states, right? Because these first three balls are all labeling the locations of the fakes. So, for example, white, white, black never appears as the first three. Three, ball, three balls. The first three balls are labeling which gold bar you're putting in there. Okay? And so, for example, when we put in uh, white, white, black, right, the fourth ball is going to change its color. So this is how Archimedes acts on the rest of the balls. Okay? So that just means if the first three balls label a state of a real gold bar, then Archimedes is going to flip the fourth ball, okay? either from black to white or white to black. Okay. So now we know exactly how the computer Archimedes is working. And the robber has his computer R. Okay? So again, his computer R is first apply four Hadamard gates to the input, then do Archimedes, then apply a Hadamard gate to the three, first three balls in the output. Okay? And when you do this, you get this state here. And you'll see you never get three white balls, right? There's always at least one black ball in the output. Okay? So instead of having to check every single gold bar in the vault, all he has to do is just input one state into his quantum computer. So this is why a lot of times people say, oh, a quantum computer can do everything at once. I don't know how accurate that statement is, but with a classical computer, Right, the best thing we can do is just ch check each gold bar, feed each gold bar state into Archimedes. Right? So we have to check every gold, and we hope to get lucky. Oh, here's a, a real one. So now I know I'm in a, a, a vault with four reals and four fakes, and then I just take all the gold bars. All right? <clears throat> but the point here is that the robber, he just has to run this computer one time <coughs> on one state to determine whether or not he's in a vault with all fakes or half reels, okay? <clears throat> and so this is kind of at the heart of why a quantum computer, at least for some problems, is much faster than a classical computer. Okay. So you could think of you know, extending this problem to 2 to the n gold bars, all right? Here's 2 to the third. Let's say for 2 to the tenth gold bars, right, the problem is going to get exponentially more difficult, or take exponentially more time for the Archimedes computer to check all the gold bars, right? But you can check that there's always going to be one state that you can feed the quantum computer that checks, that can determine whether you're in a vault with all fakes or half reals just in one runtime of the computer, okay? Okay, so just uh, some concluding remarks. So the bank robber example, and the, the, my first example, the non-local game, I learned about in the book, uh, Q is for Quantum, by Terry Rudolph. Um, and the quantum teleportation protocol was first formulated in 1993 um, by this group of researchers. And it says, um, experimental determinations of quantum teleportation have been made in information content, including photons, atoms, electrons, and superconducting circuits 
as well as a distance with 1,400 kilometers. So the quantum teleportation has been performed at a distance of 1,400 kilometers by a Chinese team. Uh, I don't know, I didn't look up the university led by Jian Wei uh, Pan. Okay? So, um, so, so these experiments have actually been carried out. So on paper, they're easy to write down, but they don't mean anything unless we can really carry them out in the real world. Okay? And that's what's so exciting about uh, quantum computing in general is we can actually do these things in the real world. But the difficult part is to actually build a quantum computer and that's basically to keep these qubits, these particles, isolated from their environment. So that you want to keep them vibrating, right? So that they stay in these states which are a sum of these terms in the vector space. Okay? So hopefully some of you guys maybe one day will be working on building a quantum computer. Right? The world uh, needs it. Okay, we stop here.